Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Coding 101 is brought to you by Braintree. Even the best mobile app won't work without the right payments API. That's where the Braintree V.0 SDK comes in. One amazingly simple integration gives you every way to pay. Try out the sandbox and see for yourself at braintreepayments.com slash coding. And by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash C101. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. On this episode of Coding 101, welcome to PowerShell. Hello and welcome to Coding 101. It's the Twitch show where we let you into the wonderful world of the Code Monkey and the Code Warrior. I'm Father Robert Ballisier, the digital Jesuit. But of course, the real show starts with this man, the man, the myth, the legend, my super special co-host, Mr. Lou Maresca, a senior software developer at Microsoft. Lou, thank you very much for coming back. Hey, guys. It's great to be back. Thanks so much. It's amazing that you come back each and every single week after all the guff you get from this show. So I, I really do appreciate it. <laughs> no guff, no guff. Now, uh, we, we've got a great show coming up because we're going to be bringing back Sarah. You may, you may remember Sarah from a wildcard episode two weeks ago where she started talking a little bit about her development in .NET and PowerShell. Well... You voted, and we listened. And what you wanted to see the most was how we use PowerShell. It is a very powerful scripting language that a lot of our audience can use out of the box. But before we do that, hey, Lou, th th there were a few interesting things that happened in the world of programming today. You, you mind if we, we run a few down? Absolutely. Let's go. Now, let me ask you first. Did you watch The Martian, the, the Matt Damon Not film? Not yet. I'm so Not looking forward to it, though. You, you really should because... The author of The Martian, a man by the name of Andy Weir, we've had on the Twit Network, actually, I think on three of our shows, we've had him on Padre's Corner, on Triangulation, and I believe he was on the new screensavers. I can't remember either that or, or uh, uh, Media Mavericks. It, it, it's an interesting story because he was actually a computer scientist. That was his job. He was a programmer for Sandia National Laboratories. And uh, on his interview with, with uh, me on Padre's Corner, he talked about how writing was his first love, but he kind of fell in to computer science. He, he just had a mind for it. Did, do you hear that story a lot? When you talk to people who you hire at Microsoft, is programming more something they fell into, or is it something that was their first love? It depends on the generation that you talk to. Like Generation Z, more people are trying to start out in computer science before, you know, before anything else, because they have these, you see these startups and these great ideas, and they're like, oh, I want to do that. But the generation before that and then before that, it's a lot of, like you said, people start out in math or they start out in something else and they find, hey, you know, I really have the mindset to, to, to actually do computer programming, problem solve and, you know, program in these different languages. So it really just depends on the generation you talk to. Right. Uh, the, the story is actually kind of inspiring. He started at the laboratories when he was 15. He was, uh, I, I, we didn't really call him interns back there. He was a teen hire, and, and, and actually he was part of a large group of teens that the laboratory brought in to do lab assistant type work. So while most of the kids who were brought in were doing things like cleaning bins and cleaning out test tubes and uh, just doing basic data entry, they saw in him skill for programming. And so he actually helped them figure out how to program the computers. Uh, that is a story I have heard a lot where someone comes in and he starts playing with the technology that the adults have bought and he's <laughs> much more proficient at it. Uh, have you heard that story before? Absolutely. Yeah, that, again, that's one of those things where I think he was waiting to, to get a security clearance for another group and then he was just dumped into this this group to uh, to do some, you know, display data and, and do other things. And he just figured out, hey, I can really do this. And that happens a lot. Even, you know, even in some of the manufacturing groups that I've worked, I worked at Anders or Bush a long time ago, and some of the programmers there were, hey, I was, you know, I was doing some other type of engineering or mathematics, and I just started doing this, and I found out I was really good at it, and I just kept going with it. So I think that happens a lot, and that's where the, the being a tinkerer really, really helps out. 
Uh, we've talked about this a lot on the show. In fact, every time we have a wild card guest, we always ask that question, what does it take to be a programmer? What do you need to actually survive in this craft? Because there are a lot of people who just look at the dollar science and say, oh, you can make a lot of money in computer science, and therefore I'm going to go into computer science. And that doesn't always work out. I'm not saying it never works out, but it's difficult to maintain passion for a job if all you see are dollar signs. What I liked about Andy when, when he came on to Padres Quarter was he said, look, he has no longer, uh, you know, he's no longer in the world of, of the computer programmer because he's dedicated his life entirely to writing. That was, again, his first love. He always wanted to be a writer. Now that he's found an entree, he doesn't want to let it go. But he said something very interesting during the interview. He said, it's not as if I quit because I was tired of computer programming and I was so happy to move away. It was just there was something else I liked more. Um, I think that's kind of the mindset that we're looking for. We're looking for somebody who wants to do it. Even if they have some other way to maintain themselves, they enjoy the challenge of working with the team, working with math, working with algorithms, and working with taking real-world problems and putting them in the code. Um, Lou, I, I've heard the same from you. When we interviewed you for the wildcard episode of, of uh, Coding 101, uh, you said much the same thing. You know, for you, it's sort of like, yeah, even if I wasn't getting paid, I'd, I'd probably be tinkering with CS. Absolutely. I think that's where, you know, I was an, I was an EE for, actually, I was going to go to school for chemistry. And then I started seeing some of what the uh, electrical engineer students were doing. They got to work on things like the ME car, which is a, you know, a race, a race car that they build and race. And then I started doing seeing other things. And then I noticed when I started being an EE, I could program microcontrollers. And then I started working with that. So I think, yeah, I mean, it's all about you're doing what you love and you're really getting interested in a problem space, find a problem that you really want to tackle. And you find out that, you know, computer science and programming can really help. Yeah. And actually web nine, two, three, two, it makes it brings up a very good point in the chat room. He says computer science is not computer programming, which is true. It, one does not necessarily lead to the other. Mm -hmm. I know computer scientists who are horrible programmers. I know computer programmers who care nothing about computer science, but <laughs> it is, it is a related field. Uh, let's move on to something else that I think our audience might have heard about but has passed through. And that is this idea of mutation testing. Th this is a topic that once you get more into the world of, of CS and, and coding, you will have to start doing. First of all, Lou, what, what is mutation testing? <laughs> so we, I think we talked about it a long time ago, but there's an idea of the concept of called what they call fuzz testing. And basically what that is, is it's nothing more than a, uh, a testing technique that you can basically uncover, you know, a variety of issues by just, you know, by changing things like, you know, f you can actually find security vulnerabilities, you can find coding errors, you can find denial of service, so forth, um, un unexpected errors, malformed data type issues, and random data, what they call fuzz. Uh, and so, but there's two different types of fuzz testing. There's mutation, mutational testing and generational testing. And mutational testing is more around, you know, changing or mutating existing input values to some of your parameters to some of your functions and and data um it's also known as dumb fuzzers um it's <laughs> basically you have a lack of understanding of how the fo of the format of the program and the structure of the program and so you just kind of send in random stuff that can or, or mutate random stuff to see what happens and so that's kind of where mutation testing kind of happened where is, is trying to change something and see what breaks Right. And it's interesting in the use of, of mutation testing to test the testers, because we all know that one of the advantages of using one of the more established frameworks is you get a suite of tools that can help you validate your code. Well, as you get more complicated, you need to make sure that the testers are actually working right for your code. So one of the te te techniques that we've used in the dev teams that I've been a part of is you change the code slightly just to see if the existing tools will catch it and reject the code. And if it doesn't, it means your tester is no longer valid. That's, that's mainly my exposure to mutation testing. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about how you do it at Microsoft. So when you have a new project that's coming out and you need to validate, what will you change in order to test the testers? So I think the first thing is, you know, from a fuzz perspective, we actually have the, the second side type of testing where we do what's called generation testing. And that means that we have a tool that will go through and go through all of your code, whether it's public or private, and it will physically generate input and output, I'm sorry, input uh, variations to see if we can break the code. And then you'll, you know, you'll get random exceptions and errors coming back from that code. And then we can go and put, make sure that we're handling all these scenarios. The other scenario is this mutational testing. And from that perspective, 
we, you know, the, 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 the testing infrastructure will go through and it'll corrupt the data. So it'll change random bits or something like that. And it'll see again, like you said, it'll see how the code kind of handles that and the factoring of the code that handles that. And it'll make sure that there are tests generated for those scenarios. Uh, and then it'll go and uh, add again, additional error handling and generate bugs and we'll go fix them. So there's a lot of generation of tests and all, that's kind of like the for forefront. And then there's the other side of things where you get a, a tester going through and testing stuff out and generating automated tests that handle all different scenarios. Uh, and so that's kind of the human factor of it. So there's two levels of it. And that's kind of where we kind of hit most of the errors and most of the issues. Uh, we, we're going to make sure that we put in the show notes and a link to an article from Codafine. And if you want to learn about mutation testing and testing the tester or testing the tester that tests the tester, you can get really <laughs> meta with this. Go ahead and look it up because it, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, Lou, we promised our audience some PowerShell. Do you think maybe we ought to deliver? Oh, yeah, love PowerShell. Now, when we come back, we're going to be speaking with Sarah. We had her on two weeks ago. She is the owner of Cleveland Tech Events and uh, an all-around great person. We'll, we'll introduce her really quickly, but before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Coding 101. And this is something that I think everyone in our audience either can use or will use if they continue on in the world of programming. And that is, how do you do mobile payments right? That's right. We could all think about the process involved in mobile payments. The, the old school way was to set up a server and maybe create a relationship with a payments processor so that you could process credit cards. And then you had to worry about security. You had to make sure your box was properly patched, that everything was hooked in properly to your application or your service. And remember, it's your reputation on the line if you expose any personally identifiable information. So you're gonna have to spend thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars to validate your solution. Yeah, you could still do it that way. I mean, old school sometimes is the best way to go. But in this case, no, not if you've got Braintree. Now, Braintree is the easiest way for developers to add mobile payments to their applications. Braintree is an API. It's an SDK. The Braintree v.0 SDK can be used by multiple languages, and it gives you every way to pay. Do you want to accept Bitcoin? Sure. How about PayPal? Yeah, we can do that. How about Apple Pay, Android Pay, Venmo? Every way your users may want to pay, Braintree will give you in one easy 10-line integration. Now, no matter what payment type, Braintree isn't just a place that will accept your payment, but they're also the place that will protect the information of your customers. They use tokenization so that personally identifiable information is never transmitted across the net. They also understand that because they're acting as your payment processor, their security is your security. If they look bad, you look bad, which is why they give you all the customer support you need to make sure your integration goes properly. In fact, if you're having trouble with your integration, they'll actually have a customer rep sit with you to guide you through it. Now it's simple, it's secure, and the developers, well, wow, they've got you covered. Don't worry about having to, to figure out how an SDK works because it's completely documented. And if you don't have the time, well, then you just don't know how to program because it's just 10 lines of code. It supports iOS, Android, and JavaScript clients, and their SDK comes in .NET, Node.js, Java, Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby. I'm telling you, if you are not using Braintree to accept payments on your mobile app, you're working too hard. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Braintree. Braintree gives you an easy way to accept multiple payment types with one integration. Integrating it into your app is as easy as inserting a few lines of code. Try it today. Try out the sandbox and see for yourself at braintreepayments.com slash coding. That's braintreepayments.com slash coding. And we thank Braintree Payments for their support of Coding 101. We welcome back to the show. Actually, this has to be the fastest turnaround of a guest from a wildcard episode to a programming module because the, the response was overwhelming. People wanted this. They wanted to see her. They thought she was fantastic. Uh, Sarah, could, could, could we see? Could we get the split screen? Oh, there she is. Now, Sarah, guys. I always mess up your last name, so I'm going to try it Go again, it. and you're going to correct me. Sarah Dukavich. You got it. Woohoo! Because I, I only I kept, messed it up once last time. I know once, but, but see, I'll, I'll keep going back. I will mess it up before the show is over. Uh, Sarah, of course, is the owner of Cleveland Tech Events, and she literally, literally wrote the book on PowerShell, which is why we're bringing her in today. Uh, Sarah, th first of all, thank you very much for coming back. Thank you very much for, for being part of Coding 101. Our audience absolutely loved you. They loved your interview, and uh, they really want to know about this thing called PowerShell because 
it's powerful. We know that. But mm -hmm. beyond that, most of us haven't experimented with it. Could you tell us really quickly, what is PowerShell? What is PowerShell? I mean, it sounds cool with the name power and the, the term shell. And it <laughs> really is its name. I mean, you're taking a shell. Think of like your bash or your Z shell or command prompt on the Windows side. And now add power to it. That's what PowerShell is. Um, it is slowly replacing the command prompt in the Windows administrator's toolback. I say slowly, not so much anymore. Nowadays, it's picked up a lot of power. Um, but it's used for creating task automation, configure manage, uh, configuration management, um, IT automation in general. Uh, even devs are using it to do a lot of automation and DevOps stuff. Um, but it, it's part of Windows. Um, you can see it. So if you, depending on what version of Windows you have, if you press the start key and start typing PowerShell, you should see it on there. But if you don't have it, you can also download it as part of what they call the Windows Management Framework. Uh, what versions of Windows would it automatically be included with? <sighs> I remember it's in, well, I want to say Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10. Right. Um, I think, yeah, stuff? XP was the last one not to include it natively. You could download it for XP, but I don't think it comes in the default installation. Correct. Correct. And so what you guys are seeing in my demos here tonight, um, I'm running Windows 10, so you're going to see PowerShell 5.0, but the stuff that I'm going to show you is not 5.0 specific. So what is PowerShell? PowerShell, it's taking the power and adding it to a shell. It's similar to, like, imagine if Bash and Z Shell and Command Prompt all got together, had a baby, and then added more power to it. That's essentially <laughs> an easy way to, to relate to all of it. Like um, so basically what it's doing is it's giving us, uh, it's the reason why I say it's replacing command prompt is because it gives us a lot more power, a lot more control over the operating system, over computers, that you didn't really have that kind of stuff in command prompt. Um, it runs on .NET. So if you're in the Microsoft stack and familiar with the .NET framework, that's what PowerShell runs on. Um, Windows 10, which is what I'm running on both my laptop that I'm talking to you guys on and on my Surface, um, it comes with PowerShell 5.0. If you're not running Windows 10, the highest uh, version of PowerShell you can get right now is PowerShell 4.0. Um, you can see what uh, version you have on your machine if it came with it, and we'll take a look at that here in a little bit. Um, but know that if it came with it, it's probably going to be 3.0 or 4.0, and 4.0 is the highest you can download. Um, is there so a big difference over... between uh, between 3.0, 4.0, and, and the version you can get on 10? Uh, there are differences, but for the things that we're going to look at, um, over today's lesson and t uh, next week's lesson, we're not going to go into any of the five five specific stuff. Okay, all right. Uh, but I mean, just just loosely, what what does five add? Because I know there there will be people in our audience who will say, oh, well, I'm curious now. What what do I get with five? Even if they don't use it, what what are the more advanced tools that you would get if you were to say upgrade to ten? There's something called one get. So one get is it's a it's a repository. Okay. It's applications that can be installed, updated, or, or removed with command line. So from a development perspective, it's if you think of uh, being able to download packages to install things, you can get things uh, out of one get that way. That's the big thing. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. And actually, I'm wondering, would I be able to run PowerShell on a Windows 10 Internet of Things kernel? So they, they, Microsoft has, is now making available the, the, Windows 10, the, the pared down Windows 10 kernel for things mm -hmm. like the Raspberry Pi. Will PowerShell run on that? I have not looked into the PowerShell running on Internet of Things thing yet, so I can't talk to that just yet. You can check. I think, I think there was a talk on, on around running on the Nano kernel, so we, we mm -hmm. can look into that. But one of the other things for 5.0 PowerShell is the... They've added a much better performance when it to, when you're talking about when you're talking to com objects, which are you know underlining what uh, com is really what the Windows Universal apps use underneath the covers, and so they've really increased the performance when you're going back and forth between .NET code and native or, or com objects, and so that whole performance gain really helps PowerShell scripts, especially because they can they need to talk to some of the underlying Windows functionality. Right, right. Okay, so so take us through it. Show us where we would find it and how we would jump into say the the admin shell. Okay, so if we can shift over to my computer. Thank you, guys. All right, so I'm going to press the Start key. I'll just bring up the Start menu, whether you're Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, we're going to have something similar, where we bring up the Start and we start typing PowerShell. So as you notice, as I'm typing PowerShell, you know, let's just bring them all. There okay. So you can see this guy is Windows PowerShell, and 
Um, so that's what I have open right now. You're going to see two things. You're going to see PowerShell and PowerShell ISE. We'll talk about ISE in a little bit. Um, that's allowing us to do a lot more. Let's get familiar with syntax before we get too carried away. Yeah, yeah. We got okay. plenty of time to get into the more advanced things. Let's actually look at how the scripting language looks on screen. Yes. Okay. So this is PowerShell that we're looking at. And I'm not too sure. Let's say that I've just inherited a machine. I'm not too sure what version of PowerShell I'm running. I can do dollar sign host and press enter. And now I can see what version of PowerShell am I working with on my oh, machine. OK. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff going on here. The things that I'm specifically looking at are the name and the version. The name is just telling me that I'm in the console. And then the version is 5.0. You're going to see the same thing for Windows 7. You're going to see that for Windows 8. Um, and I can see some of the PowerShell MVPs in the chat channel talking about the awesomeness of PowerShell 5 and also seeing that PowerShell 5 is coming soon for Windows 7. So those of you guys who are wondering when it's coming out soon, thank you, PowerShell MVPs, for your support in the episode tonight. <laughs> I just checked mine. I'm, I'm running 4.0 on my Windows 8.1 machine. but. Uh... Okay, I'll, I'll get five later on. All right, show me some cool... So I've, I've just checked my version. What yep. else can I do? Uh, so the syntax okay. is dollar sign command, is, is, or what, what no, am I looking at? Give so me dollar, dollar sign host is a system variable. That okay. dollar sign Got is the, uh, the symbol for I'm working with a variable of some sort. And dollar sign host is a built-in system variable. So that's how I need that. Uh, they say now I can also just type host. So used to doing the dollar sign as well. Right, right. And that's like a global so, variable that you can you can call anywhere, right? From anywhere. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this so this tells us what version we're working with. Um, so uh, well, I, I can imagine that everyone in the in the audience who is listening right now, they've just checked their machines to find out what version that they're working with. Where mm -hmm. do they go from here? So. There could be a bunch of things. So first of all, if you're not familiar with this, the console environment, it is an interpreted thing. Um, and I don't know why they like to do this. So I'm going to do CLS, clear my screen. Um, but a lot of programming languages, when they're doing interpreted stuff, like to show 2 plus 2. OK, your programming language is a glorified calculator. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so just because you can do it in Python or Ruby or any other interpreter, 2 plus 2 is. Four. Hello world. Hello world. Is a string. I mean, this looks nothing. really basic, but at the same time, oh, this... there's a lot more to it. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot more to it, but it's just funny because people are like, "Oh, I want to do printf hello world." Just hello world. Um, something to note. So, being based in .NET, everything in here is. Uh, Everything in here is returning a .NET object. Oh. What that means is that the stuff coming out is something. So let's, if I do, uh, and you're going to see something funny, and we'll go step by step what that means. I'm going to do uh, host pipe ember pipe more. And the reason why I'm doing this, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the host command. Once that host command runs, I'm going to do something to the result called get member. We'll talk about what this get member is, but for uh, easy sanity's sake, get member is going to check to see what this host uh, uh, variable is doing, like what kind of result is it, what's its type. And I'm doing pipe more because I'm working on a very small screen and I want to be able to show the results, so paging. So if you're familiar in the uh, command windows with uh, between uh, uh, Linux and pipe more or uh, command prompt slash p, this is paging your result. All right. So I'm going to see if this is going to let me page up. It's not. So what you see when I press enter, uh, there it goes. Ooh. Yeah, lots of stuff. There's a lot of things going on. Um, the <laughs> thing that I'm really looking at right now is just type name, the thing up at the top. That's system.management.automation.internal.host.internalhost. So that tells me what exactly the host object is. So this is giving us everything that was inside that, that .NET object host. Correct. So that internal host has all sorts of properties. Let's Ooh. go back to something, to something simple. I'm just, just going to do... Just to note, too, 
one of the one of the keys to learning PowerShell, what she's showing you right now, is do, do you really want to have a sense of adventure and just really the joy <laughs> of exploring things? Because this way, the way she's showing you is finding out how to find different objects and their members and how to call those members. So th th by doing this, she'll, be, she'll be able to show you how to do other things and how to understand other things. So just start playing with the different members of the object and see, to see what they right. do. All right. Well, exactly. Well, and the thing is, so any command that I'm going to show you guys today, if you pipe get member, you'll see what type of object object it is. So I'm going to do something simple. I'm going to say hello world. Just treating it like this is it's a string and I'm going to pipe. So that means pipeline. That means I'm going to take the result, put it in a pipeline, push it to the next command. Pipe oh. get member, pipe more. And that's again because I don't know how many results this is going to return to me, <laughs> but the pipe more is going to page it so that if it gives us a lot, we know what's going on. Okay. So now you should see I'm going to wait for Skype to refresh here. Okay. There Please. we go. There it goes. Okay, so you're going to see type name is system.string. Now, some other things to note, so the, the different things you can do with a string, that's what methods are. So for those who aren't familiar with object-oriented programming, um, objects are your fundamental unit. It's you have a thing. And those things have properties. Those things have methods. Like I talked to my apprentices in my... Uh, my day job. The object, so I've got a phone, and the phone has color, and it has width, and it has height, and then it would have some kind of actions that, could be, that it could do. Um, same thing with, so if we go back to the PowerShell window with strings, we can do things such as uh, removing, such as finding a character within there, that's what index of is. So this is things we can call on the string. And it tells us whether it's a method or a property, and then the definition. So get members, and as you notice, as I press space to go to the next page, there's a lot of different methods on string. And that's the way it should be, because, well, string is what we call one of our primitive types, one of our fundamental types of our uh, programming language. Wow. Okay. Yeah, a whole I mean, lot of methods. Lot of, <laughs> well, and I just press space bar again so you'll see the last page. So get member is nice because you can see what kind of objects you're playing around with. Now, let's go back to what, let's talk about what get member is. So you guys notice that the syntax was get dash member. In PowerShell, these get dash member and get dash something, those are called commandlets. When you see that written out, it's spelled C-M-D-L-E-T, but it's pronounced commandlet. Hmm, okay. And so they are a fundamental building block in PowerShell, um, and they have a particular format. They take the format of, yeah, I see how somebody says apt-get. Yeah, I mean, it's you've got verb-noun is the, the syntax, and there are certain verbs that you have to use. So I'm going to clear the screen again, just so that we can see my typing. And I'm gonna do something. So if I start typing the word get and dash, I can press tab. Oh, I can nice. go through tab completion, beautiful thing. I can say get, and what I'm gonna look for here is get dash verb. I love that. Well, because I mean, that's that's what I expect out of a CLI. A CLI automatic, always has autocomplete. It helps me cycle through it. Uh, now, I gotta stop for a second and ask. Sure. There are going to be people who are going to start experimenting. Is there anything that they can do in PowerShell that will mess up their system? I, I mean, we just we gotta. What are the things they should stay away from? Because we're, we're asking them to experiment. I don't want to ask them to experiment with the wrong thing. So I could tell you what they could do to experiment to mess up their system, but by doing that, that would just make <laughs> it break it and come back to us like we messed up our system because of you. Okay. I don't feel that lucky today. So you don't want to put that in their mind, but but so there yeah. are there are some commands that they could do that that would put the system in an unrecoverable state. Uh, not necessarily in an unrecoverable. Sometimes an undesirable. Actually, if you delete your system files, okay. but you could do that at any. <laughs> Okay. But, I mean, I mean, there are things, so some of the things I've done before is, um, so let's say you wanted to, so get verb, let me start there, just so you guys can see that there are various verbs. Uh, let me do, uh, I'm going to do a different thing. So instead of pipe more, I'm going to do what they call pipe out dash grid view. Well, let's look at all the cool outputs we have in PowerShell. Can you see that? Let's see. Whoa. Yeah, Wait. there's a fancy window there. What? I don't Wait. Think well, how did you? Wait, how did you pop that up? 
Ah, that Lee Holmes <laughs> PowerShell uh-huh. cookbook. Hold on. Wait, where'd that come from? All right, hold on, hold on. I'll bring it back to me. <laughs> Let me get rid of that guy. It doesn't look like he wants to resize, so. All right, so I want to press the up arrow to cycle through my commands, just like any other shell, and press enter, and that pops up. So what I used, instead of doing that pipe more and paging in the command window, I did pipe out dash grid view. Oh, that's nice. Now, something to note, I am running in Windows 10 and in a, a normal desktop user mode. If you're on a server that's in what they call server core mode, which means no GUI, you won't use out grid view. Right. There's no grid view when there's no GUI. Yeah, that would that'd be kind of difficult to do it. <laughs> yeah. You can't yeah. have a window of commands if you have no windows. <laughs> okay. I, I think that's an easy way no. to explain it. Right, Sarah, no. th- yeah. I think Windows users have been looking at th- for this for a long time. because Again, yeah. th- this PowerShell is something that most of our audience have heard of. I bet not a lot of them have experimented with. But even on Coding 101, we've shown shells that come equipped with OS X. And we've seen the Linux users really make fun of the Windows users because they didn't have the fine control from a command line that you can get with Linux. It looks like with PowerShell, I get all that. And, and this, this is bash for Windows, right? Uh, yes and no. OK, give, uh, me, give me the yes and no. <laughs> so the no part, we don't have grep. We don't okay. have tail. We don't have a lot of those kind of tools. However, I do have things such as I can do LS. Like I tell my Windows friends, LS list stuff. And so I'm looking at what's in my folders here. Uh, so instead of do I have LS, I can do man. So let's say I need to figure out what is this get member thing. I could say man get member. Again, I'm going to pipe through more because there's a lot of output on this guy. But now I can see the help files, which leads me to another thing to note. So as of PowerShell, uh, I want to say it's probably 3.0, the uh, help files are not included by default with PowerShell. So when you go to run it, you're going to get a different output. You're going to say, you'll see something saying along the lines of, I don't have the help files. You have to run a commandlet to get those files. Right, right. I've already run that on my Surface just because I didn't know how we would be on time. However, so... Uh, let's, just so you can see this is a help file, I'm going to clear my screen. Um, but the, the command that we use to update our help files is update-help. And so when I press enter... Sarah, what is gonna... a commandlet? Can you go over that? So, yeah. So the commandlet, like I said earlier, is a fundamental building block in PowerShell. It's structured verb-noun. And as I was showing earlier, so update-help here didn't have anything. Get verb. Pipe it through more. So in the PowerShell world, we have uh, specific verbs that we support for commandlets. Commandlets do things with nouns, and they act on things with nouns, and they have certain naming schemes. If you use, if you create your own commandlets with a verb that's not on this list, you'll get some warning saying, that's not nice. We have our own way of doing things. So, right. um, so if we go back to my screen, you can see some of the output from get verb. That I just brought it to the command. Uh, window. So you can see we have things from starting and stopping, uh, saving, restoring, new, invoke, install, get, set. So if you're familiar, for those of you guys who hear like getters and setters or accessors and mutators, the PowerShell equivalent are going to be get, set. Um, That's just some of the things we can do. Um, Actually, I wanted to go back to what is something that we can show you guys that could mess up their computers and (laughs) kind of how to avoid that. I just, I can't help it. Let's give them one. Let's give them one because someone will be a wise ass and want to do this on his system. So let's do it. Let me show them the one that I like doing as a wise ass because, well, that's what I am. Uh, Where did my PowerShell window go? Come back, PowerShell. All right. So what I'm going to do is restart my PowerShell. And I'm going to drag Skype away. And we're going to do get process. So get process is going to list all of the processes running on my machine. Oh, I'm going to pipe I see it where to you're going with this. stop process. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's nice is if I actually do run this, I can reboot my machine, and it's a lot easier to come back from that. I've done this. Don't do this unless you do something like this. I'm going to do dash what if and pipe through more. Again, paging it so you guys can see what it's going to do. But that dash what if is the, if I do this, what's going to happen? <laughs> so then I could say, uh, enter. Oh, more did not work. 
I didn't more work. Uh oh. It's okay. <laughs> did we, we did, we did no. just bork your machine, did we? <laughs> no. no. No, actually. Oh, there we go. There we go. There it goes. I'm like, so you can see the what if context. Oh, of, okay. Wow. If I run something, this is what it's going to do. Thankfully, it was able to give us some context as to, okay, if I'm going to stop all my processes, <laughs> this is what it looks like. Now, there's something else, which is the other, please help me, I'm doing something stupid, and that's dash confirm. I, I like the fact that it's actually showing me ports. Oh, yeah. All right, hold on. Let me, uh, that's not, I don't think those are uh, ports. Those are process IDs. Oh, process IDs. Okay. Hey, you met. Uh, sir, sir, question. Every yeah. once in a while, someone will get a window that will pop up on their machine, and it's it's one of those annoying, it it really doesn't want you to shut it down. Could I use that instead of jumping into the task manager to kill a particular process? Oh, yeah, you can kill processes. So let's say that I had a process on my machine that I, uh, what is a good process? Skype. Let me, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at that. No. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to kill it, but just so you guys Don't can see. Kill it. So what I'm doing is get process star Skype star scar, star Skype star. So just like your wildcard searching in, in a, a window, so I can see that there's a Skype process. But let's see, maybe there's something better like star. I'll even give you memory there. Yeah. Really. By the way, you've got in the chat room, you've got er, uh, Adam Bertram, who's also an MVP, who's saying, uh, "Get process pipe, get random pipe, stop process." Oh, stop process. <laughs> <laughs> Russian roulette. I saw that. Uh, you can get all. You can get into all sorts of trouble if you really want to. Well, I, I'm thinking like, can you, uh, for example, with Chrome or Firefox, especially Chrome, mm -hmm. because Chrome. Ooh is a resource hog sometimes. Can you, yes. can you isolate a particular instance of Chrome rather than shutting down the entire browser? Yeah, so I mean, I could do get process and I could look at the process ID. And then if I do get process tab, I can do dash ID and then say, okay, uh, better yet, do I have, I don't have Chrome on here, but let me open up some edge windows and see if that'll work. Ooh, uh, edge, so, okay. Eh, this is Windows 10, I'm yeah. play, right? So we're gonna open up that guy, and we're gonna open up, I don't know, uh, Bing, why not? All right, so I'm gonna do a get process. Uh, I don't know what edge operates under, so let's see. So now I see that there's three edge CP processes and a, a core, pro another process. I'm going to guess that the CPs are related to that. We will find out here shortly. So I'm, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say get process, dash ID. I'm going to get 5780. I don't know what that is, but we're going to get it. I'm going to pipe it to stop process. So what I'm going to do is the, proce the Microsoft Edge CP process that's running on process ID 5780 needs to go away. <laughs> Just stop it. And, and usually uh, on my main machine, when I, which is what I'm talking to you guys on over Skype, um, I am killing Chrome because of a runaway process because I am a web developer by trade. I love, by so, the way, I really like the syntax on this. Get something and pipe it to something. That, yep. oh, that's, that's wonderfully simple. I don't know what it killed. <laughs> it killed something. It killed something <laughs> and, and created another process ID because if I did another get process edge. So that's not it. So you know what? This it is killed a edge process. I can, uh, but let's go go big or go home. Dash ID, <laughs> but, uh, dash ID. Let's give it the play, the uh, process ID and stop process. Uh, now if I do an Alt Tab, it's okay. gone. There so I just killed all of it. So Microsoft Edge by itself is the whole thing. Nice, nice. Now uh, we need to take a break here, but when we come back. We've been playing around with syntax, but of course, you're going to take us into more advanced topics. You're actually going to show us how to use the scripting language. And actually, Lou found a very interesting story about running PowerShell on a Internet of Things device. So we've, we've got plenty more to go. But first, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the second sponsor of this episode of Coding 101, and it's lynda.com. Now, what is lynda.com? Lynda.com is the repository for knowledge. It's what we use here at the Twit Brick House. It's what a lot of my friends who are makers and doers and the curious use whenever they need not just to learn new skills, but to have a reference for the skills that they already have. Lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the makers, the doers, the curious, for people who want to make things work. Maybe you want to learn a new programming language. Maybe you want to learn how to develop an app, take better photos, or sharpen your Photoshop skills. 
Lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Oh, right now, their new courses include Up and Running with Google Apps Script, Building Apps for Android Wear Devices, Arduino Plus, a Pulse with Modulation, and the Foundations of Programming Databases. If you've always wanted to build an iOS app, Lynda.com just added a new course called Building a Note-Taking App for iOS 9 with Swift, which takes you step by step through all the steps that you need in developing an app for iOS 9. And by the end of it, you'll have developed a fully functional app. Of course, they also have versions of that course for Android and Windows Phone. It's, Lynda is really the place you go if you are curious about how something works and you want to tinker. Now, with a Lynda.com membership, you can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule. You can learn on your own pace. Courses are structured so that you can watch them from start to finish or consume them in bite-sized pieces. And we all know that when you get to learn the way you want to learn, you learn better. You can also browse course transcripts. This is one of my favorite features. Rather than having to sit through an entire lesson, an entire course, if you have a question about one particular thing, like for example, how do I do X in PowerShell? Rather than watching the entire PowerShell module, I say go through the, tra the course transcripts and it will show me where I should jump to in the video just to answer the problem that I'm having. You can download tutorials and watch them on the go from your iOS or your Android devices. And you can create and save playlists, sharing them with your friends so they know what you've been getting into. It's a great way to share knowledge and again, be part of the lynda.com experience. Uh, your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one low flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash C101 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash C101. And we thank lynda.com for their support of Coding 101. Let's get back to the action. Lou, uh, earlier in the show, we asked about this PowerShell on an Internet of Things device. You just found out that, yeah, we've got it. Absolutely, yes. The, the IoT core has PowerShell on it. And the really easy thing to do is you can actually remotely execute PowerShell commands using the WinRM command. And you actually run the command on your computer, on your main desktop, and it will execute on the, or the Raspberry Pi or whatever IoT device you're using. It's very cool kind of like cross -com compilation execution. And I, really, honestly, that, that is the way to do it. That's important for an Internet of Things device because IoT devices tend to be very low power. They don't have a lot of spare resources. So if you can get rid of the GUI and get rid of any need to locally input commands, but rather run them over a scripting language, it means you get a lot more work out of your IoT devices without having to put a lot more resources into them. Absolutely. Yeah. That, and this is cool because you can you can then, you know, kind of get the full power of the device without having to c compile something and load it on there. You can just, you know, run the commands on there and, and get information and execute code and that kind of thing on demand using the PowerShell. Yeah, I actually I already have an idea. I, uh, what I'd love to do is I'd like to take a lot of low power devices like Raspberry Pis, put them at various points in my network. And now I have network probes that I could run commands on that will give me a real world measurement of how that particular node of the network is doing. So rather than me running from a central admin tool, I can jump onto the network as if I'm a user on one part of the network or a remote office. Uh, that's actually, wow, okay, yeah, that's that's a project for the weekend. Fantastic, thanks, Lou. <laughs> All right, Sarah, let's get back to you. We've been, we've been okay. playing, you've just shown us how to really mess up our computer by stopping processes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, go ahead and reboot now. And go ahead and reboot. <laughs> Just don't 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 delete everything, and you'll be able to you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, stay away from that one. Uh, what else do they need to know? Because we're we're going to ask them between now and the next episode to really mm -hmm. start poking around. I mean, if you're running a Windows box, and yeah. if you're running a Windows Seven or above, if you're running Windows XP, please stop that. Uh, go Windows Seven <laughs> and above. Get PowerShell. Actually, you've got PowerShell on it. Just start poking around. Sarah has shown you how to bring up the window, how to bring up the list of commands. And as Lou said, just start playing with the objects. Start playing with the methods attached to the objects and see what happens. What else do they need to know before they start poking around under the hood? Um, before they start poking around under the hood, if they want to download like a Hello World file or some kind of PowerShell file, let's say they have one and they want to run it, they should probably also know something about how PowerShell locks that down at, at first. Okay, so, yes, let's, let's look through that. So let's go over to my machine. 
Uh, we're in the same PowerShell session, just so you can see in my documents folder, I have a hello world.ps1 file. That means anything with .ps1 is a PowerShell file. Even though we're on PowerShell 5, they're .ps1. It's just how they roll. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to open up documents just so you guys can see, and for simplicity's sake, Ooh, we're keeping right. it with Notepad. So I'm going to open, uh, open with... Notepad. And I'm running this on a surface, so I apologize if this seems a little slow. I'm using my type cover. So in Notepad, basically what I have is um, it, it's hello world, and it's doing a function which is called get hello world, which is doing something called write host, which is outputting to the the command or the console window, and it's going to just write out the string hello world. So we're overcomplicating hello world just for so the sake of a, having a PowerShell script to do just it. For giggles. But of course, now you've given us the uh, the comment code, which is good. This is good. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the okay. actual script is just function get hello world. Uh-huh. All right. I like that. All right. Now, in, in this particular one, let me post this link to the channel just so you guys can see where it's at. It's at uh, www.saduki.com slash files slash hello world dot ps1 and we will make sure that that link is in the show notes so don't don't feel panicked that you have to stop rewind and, and play it back it, it will be in the show notes so you can download this on your own okay so you can see it's a simple file but now let's say i downloaded it from the internet and now i actually want to run it or in this case i just saved it on here so what i'm going to do in my PowerShell window, go away, Skype. That's the scary part, right? I just downloaded a PowerShell command from the internet, and I'm going to run it. <laughs> Before you run it, open it and make sure you know what it's doing. Open it in Notepad, <laughs> your favorite text editor. And my main thing, I open it either Notepad++, or if I really want to open up the ISC, which we'll look at in a future episode, then I'll open that up. No, but I find now, the best the best way to, to run PowerShell is just download it, just trust it, and run it as an administrator. <laughs> it's much well, better that okay. way. Okay. Okay, so as you're going to notice right now, my PowerShell, if you look in the upper left corner, it might be small in the, for what you guys see. It just says Windows PowerShell in the title. I'm not running this as an administrator. Right. I'm just running this as, as little me on purpose. Um, don't give me a loaded gun. I'll shoot myself in the foot. I don't would feel you like ever? Well, would you ever recommend running PowerShell as an administrator? Uh, there are some functionality that, yes, you will need it for, but I don't recommend running it all the time like that. Right. Um, so what I'm doing is that dot slash says I'm running a PowerShell file that's in this path or in this folder, and I'm just going to press enter. And now you'll see something kind of gross. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of gross, isn't it? What that's basically saying is it says that it can't be loaded, see, see about execution policies. Um, something to note with this particular error message, everything else you don't really need to worry about in here at the moment. Um, but about execution policies, so I'm going to say get help, get dash help, also I could say man, about underscore execution, and I just did started typing execution to tab, so right. tab completion there too, and enter. So this is going to explain why are we getting this error. <laughs> and you should see it all scroll by because it's, <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you don't do Pike Whoa. more. <laughs> it all goes by. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, PowerShell, <laughs> yeah, PowerShell is kind of is, is, is saving us from shooting ourselves in the foot with a loaded gun. So there's something called the execution policy. And you can see at the end of this file, it says, see also, get us execution policy, set execution policy. We'll keep it simple. Let's do a get, uh, again, I like clearing the screen so you guys can see what I'm typing up here. So I'm going to do get execution policy and press enter. And you can see that right now my execution policy is restricted. That means that it's not going to run a lot of the PowerShell files on the outside. Um, it's, again, to protect ourselves. So there are a couple ways around it. The one that I'm going to show you, do only in a development environment. Um, again, I don't want you guys breaking your production machine and then going, she showed us this and said we could do this on production. <laughs> do not door. do this on production. So set uh, execution policy, pipe, load gun. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. Because I'm going to tell, uh, set it to unrestricted. Oh. <laughs> just so you guys can see. It just sounds bad. <laughs> it is. That's why I say do this only in your development environment. There are other execution policies. And if you look at the about underscore execution uh, policy help file, it tells you what those things are in more detail, greater detail. 
Um, I am going to say yes for now. It's okay. And it says it can't do it. Again, this is done on purpose. You know that whole not running as an administrator thing? Right. I, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a console. Oops. So I'm right-clicking on my PowerShell that's already open, and I'm going to say run as administrator. Oh, boy. Again, don't do this on production, please. Ugh. And if you do and you break anything, don't come to me. And now no, we're the, really the administrator now, so... Well, yeah. and that, uh, so, there, so, just, so two things to note with this. Um, up at the top in the title of the uh, window, you're going to see administrator colon Windows PowerShell. So that's tip one that you know you're running in uh, administrator mode. The other thing is when you open up a PowerShell window in administrator mode, your path is your, your system. It is not your user home profile. Right. right. So is there any way to, to change the execution policy just for that command prompt and not for any all the rest of them? Uh, yeah, and that's what. So what I'm showing you, the set execution policy, is going to be specifically for this session. I'm right. not going to show you guys how to do that for all of your sessions. Maybe in a few future episode when I can trust you guys a little more, but <laughs> not yet. Yeah, no, that's just a, it's a really bad idea unless you know exactly what you're doing. Exactly. Because right. you're you're turning off everything that's built into PowerShell to keep you from doing something stupid. Right, and I don't like the idea of showing how to turn off all the security. The security is there for a reason. Yeah, Bflub um, is saying it's like yeah, permanent pseudo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be a great we idea. Want, yeah, we is do have any want point permanent. Where, is there any point where you can download a, a PS1 file and be able to execute it without having to change the execution policy? Without changing the execution policy, you could change the file. You can change some of the the. Uh, I think it's a permission or property thing on there. Um, and I end up having to look it up each time because there's a way you can unblock it. It's easier to do the set execution policy. So I'm going to do set execution policy. Or actually, let's make sure because I think I might have done it already. Get execution policy. Now we're unrestricted. And oh. I navigated to my documents folder. And now I can run the, the script. Right. Yeah, Dallas, unblock. So I, I think we should stress at this time, if you are going to do this, please open the script first and make sure yes. there's nothing in there that you don't want to run because there's Windows will, PowerShell will no longer stop it from running. No, it will not. PowerShell can't prevent stupidity. <laughs> PS stands for PowerShell, not prevent stupidity. No language stupidity. can, get it? <laughs> nothing. Now, nothing. But what, what, you did, what you did is just for the session. So if I close that window and start it up again, uh, it, it will be back to restricted. Yeah. Okay, so well, let's take a look at this. First, let's execute this hello world. Now that I'm in unrestri unrestricted, hello world, enter. Okay, there's nothing that's going on there, but if I do um, get dash hello world, oh, where'd it go? Uh, it's not, oh, never mind. I know what it's doing there. Um, so let me, I'm going to copy and paste it in, and we'll talk about it. it huh. Yeah. I'm going to exit this guy. He's the other guy. All right. So um, ideally, I should have been able to open that and execute it. And that's because I didn't edit that. So edit. I added the function. Um, not what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's the joys uh, of a live demo, folks. The joys of a live demo. I'm like, I don't want to show you guys that one yet. That's for the next episode. Uh, open with notepad. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a line after this and just say, get hello world, just so you oh. can see how it calls it. Okay. So that when I execute it, so think of like you're executing a batch file. Right now I'm just executing a PS1 file. So I'm going to clear screen. That's and actually if I do uh, H and start typing uh, and then tab H it. and tab, yeah. it does the dot slash in there automatically. And so now you can see it does the hello world. All right. Okay, well, so that I think this is the challenge. Let's make it really simple. The homework for the people at home will be to get this script. So there will be a link in the show notes for you to download this exact script that she's been playing with and get it to run. So using what she just told you about unrestricting a particular session, make Hello World run. And then we can move on to the second lesson. Speaking of the second lesson, Sarah, would you like to give them some hints on what we'll be doing next week? Now, this is going to be a weird module. Let me, let, me, uh, let me be advanced about this. We're not doing four straight weeks. We're going to do two weeks. We're going to stop. We're going to be doing another module and a, and a, a few uh, wildcard episodes. Then we'll be bring, bringing Sarah back in November. So these two episodes of PowerShell 
really should give you enough to, to get up and running and toying with PowerShell before she comes back. But Sarah, if they start playing with this for homework, what can they expect to see next week? Uh, oh, good catch, Adam. I, uh, my execution policy. Uh, one quick, I'm sorry, I need to bring that back up. Oh, yeah, so Adam's saying that the execution policy is set in the registry and applies to all sessions going forward. Oh, mm. <laughs> Hold on. <get laughs> I don't like that. Yeah, no, I don't like that either. That sounds bad. Oh, boy. <laughs> that, 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 that's something that, no, we can't let that one slide, no, Adam. Can't. That's Okay, don't, don't do that one. Folks, folks, that thing, that, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that is okay, deliberately so cocking the gun. So let's, yeah, let's fix that. Let's fix that real Let's quick. fix that. And let's hopefully uh, run as administrator, yes. I'm going to set that execution policy back to restricted on purpose. <laughs> Don't want to shoot myself. S set execution policy, execution policy, restricted. End of file. <laughs> there we go. Do that. <laughs> or you will regret it. Yes. Adam, <laughs> thank you for reminding me on that one. Oh, and by the way, the thing that Adam said, too, is he said, you're, by default, maybe your, your execution policy should be, should be remote signed, right. which means that you know when you deploy these prod these PowerShell scripts everywhere, it should be signed by, you know, a certificate. So this way you know it potentially is coming from somebody that you know or that's 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 trusted, right? So I think that should be the default, if not lower than that, unre uh, restricted, right? Right. Yeah. And, and actually, I will ratchet up the fun a little bit. Um, the link that we're going to give you, some of the files I will randomly put malicious commands in. So you better open up the file and check it before you run it. Uh, but again, back to back to the uh, the question, Sarah, which is, what what will you be showing us next week? So next week, we're going to actually look at that thing that started before, which is called the integrated scripting environment. We're going to take a look at how you can write PowerShell scripts. Um, you'll have a nice window that you can compose these things, and you have a place where you can see them run. We'll talk about the different building blocks. We'll talk about variables. We'll talk about commandlets. We'll talk about providers and modules, and what are those? What does that mean? Uh, how cool is it? And I can show you guys a custom module that I built for an uh, intro to PowerShell talk. We'll take a look at that, amongst other things. Going forward, we'll then look eventually at creating a, a way to consume the Twit API via PowerShell. <gasps> Fun oh. that lies ahead. Fun you that just lies made ahead. me so happy. <laughs> I, actually, I will say PowerShell runs Twit because we've got an ingestion machine that checks to see if these uh, SSD carts are plugged in. So after we record this episode, it actually plugs into a machine, a Windows box, that will automatically download it into the right directory so that our editors can get hold of it. So PowerShell does run in the, in the brick house. We wouldn't have That's shows awesome. if it weren't for PowerShell. Sarah Dukevich, thank you so very much. Again, the, the uh, uh, owner of Cleveland Tech Events, uh, the author of the book about PowerShell, we want to thank you for being our Code Warrior. This has been so much fun. I don't think I've had this much fun on Coding 101 since some, some of the very earliest episodes with Lou, uh, just because it's, it's something exciting, it's something new. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can find your work, and of course, where they can find your operation? So you can find me on Twitter. I am Saduki, S-A-D-U-K-I-E. Um, I am in the Cleveland, Ohio area, so if you're in the Cleveland area, reach out to me and we can hang out for drinks or go to user groups, uh, stuff like that. I will be at CodeMash in Sandusky, so if you're a developer, uh, CodeMash is where it's at. Uh, I will be speaking there. I am here on, on Coding 101 this week, next week, and two times in November as well. So you guys can find me around. And I, I've actually got it on a good authority that she is a master of dim sum. So if you like, Ooh, if you like dumplings, yes, yes, yes. there we go. That's where we go. Also, also big thanks to our co-host Lou Maresca, again your senior lead from Microsoft. Sir, I, I wouldn't want to do the show without you. Could you tell the folks at home where they can find you and and your work? Thanks, Padre. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me at uh, Lou M M on Twitter. And of course, all my work on uh, do my day, day, day job is actually CRM at dynamics.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for joining us for this episode of Coding 101. Don't forget that you can find all of our episodes at our Twitch show page at twit.tv slash coding. If you go there, you'll also find our show notes, which is where you will need to go if you want to download Sarah's Power, uh, PowerShell script. So uh, make sure you drop by again, twit.tv slash coding. Also, you can find me on Twitter, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's P-A-D-R-E-S-J. And uh, don't forget that we do this show live most, most Mondays at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time, live.twit.tv.
Twitch.tv. And as long as you're watching live, jump into our chat room. You'll see me pull questions straight out of the chat room. It's a, it's a way for you to interact with the hosts and the guests. That's irc.twit.tv. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasser. And uh, hey, Lou, what do we say at the end of every episode? Vile. End, End of, of line. Vile. End of line. That thing. <laughs> let's let's try it again. How about all three of us at the same time? Right. What do we say at the end of every show? One, two, three. End of, End line. of line. That works. Uh -huh. <laughs>